Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christina Zanetti. I'm the director at Bruce Silverstein Gallery. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon while we host Sean Walker, one of the founding members of the Camoigny Workshop and fellow Camoigny Workshop member, curator, and scholar, Danny Dawson, discussing Sean's current exhibition at the gallery, Lost and Found. The collection we have on view features the 39 prints, most of which were recently returned to Sean after being on loan for close to 50 years. During this conversation, you'll have a chance to view most of the works we have on view at the gallery and many of which have never been shown before. After the talk, we will take a few minutes to answer any questions. So please post them into the Zoom chat and I'll do my best to get to all of them. Um, and with that, I'll pass things over to Danny and Sean. Thank you both for being a part of this and leading us through the conversation today. Nope, I cannot hear him. Okay. Can, Can you, you hear? Go? Okay. Good afternoon. And no. I can't hear him. Good afternoon. Can you? Danny, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you well, Sean. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So it's up to us. You should be able to hear me now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Hello, Sean Walker. Sean, yes, sir. really pleasure to do this because I just want to introduce Sean Walker as a photographer. Sean, you've been a photographer since the 1960s? Yes. Okay, since 1960, he was taught by a relative, taught by an uncle, but he learned the finer art of uh, printing through Lou Drape and a few other people of the Camoingay workshop. You know, so when, when he uh, joined the early, as an early member of Camoingay. But Sean was born in Harlem, lived in Harlem, and still lives five blocks from where he grew up you know, in Harlem. John, uh, could you please explain about this, this project, how it came about? Um, well, these were, I learned, as Danny said, that I learned how to print from the members in the Kamonge workshop. My uncle was the inspiration for photography for me more so than taught me photography. He taught me more about taking pictures. That was what he was more into. And I hung out in the bars when he, he had the first Polaroid camera in the community. So he went into the bars on the weekends, Fridays and Saturday nights, and he did uh, photographs. And, you know, and I would just carry the bag with the film in it. So I was a carry boy at the particular time. So that was how I got pretty much inspired by it. Um, but uh, and I went to high school for photography. So at, at the time, when we were all graduating from uh, junior high school, we were trying to figure out what schools we were going to go. And at the time, there was only cooking. There were only trade schools open up, high schools. So there was, um, the uh, I know there was a cooking school. I can't think of the name of it now. And there was another trade school. And then it was school on auto mechanics. And I didn't see myself in that at any particular point. I couldn't see that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I couldn't see that. I see myself in that at any particular point. So I had a high school, junior high school teacher telling me that I had some artistic ability. And I don't know what that meant because I didn't show any in my family. But what happens is I had a science class and I used to show these really labored over um, drawings and sketches of the cells and Petri dishes and things like that. And he saw some skill and he recommended me tell my parents that I should go to a high school for photography. And that should be the way that I could actually realize whatever particular skills that I had. So that's how I went through high school. So this is way before I got to uh, Kamoinge. Yeah, but I didn't so, even know they existed. What? High school for photography? It was Benjamin Franklin High School, okay. which still exists. But now it's a uh, high school for um, special, ed special kids, mm -hmm. uh, special ed academic kids. Uh, I think it might be science related, but um, they had a course and, you know, a seriously dark room in the whole nine yards. So that's where I started on getting myself introduced to photography, I'd say. Okay. Sean, but that also led you to filmmaking and to quite a few other things, which will show up in the exhibit too. The, the, the filmmaking led you to travel. You know, so 
Well, filmmaker is interesting. I was in Kamoya, so now I'd learned how to operate cameras. You know, I know how to shutters and f-stops and so on and so forth. There was a f- underground film sh- screening down in the village. Uh, Andy Warhol, Jonas Mikas, and um, another another guy, I can't think of his name, but well-known, um, Penny Baker. They were all showing these films and a bunch of other white underground filmmakers. They were all showing these films. And uh, New Wave, and so you know, no people, no nothing, strips, and you know, very avant-garde stuff. I left that meeting and said, I think I'm going to take film because I could be a filmmaker, mainly because what I saw those guys show. So I went to a place on 14th Street called the Free School, the Free University. That's where I took filmmaking at. And it was, um, who was it? Um, Alan Siegel was my teacher. Now he taught there. And because I kind of knew more, more introduced, introduced to the camera and more about the camera than most of the members of the students that were there, we kind of took to each other. He took to me. And he would just sort of say, Here, here's a camera, go out, shoot, shoot, community, shoot, you know. And so that's what really got me into starting to learn filmmaking. Okay. Sean, could you talk about Lost and Found? Because that's really a specific part of, of okay, your Okay, Lost and Found, one of the things is somebody's got to turn up the volume for me, for Danny, so I can hear him better. I'm old. I don't hear well. <laughs> I, I can turn up my volume. See if okay, knows. you turn it. Okay, that's cool. Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Danny will know when to start the slides, right? He'll, he'll yeah. start. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was um. I was on a six. I was in a studio on Sixth Avenue and Thirty Eighth Street. This is nineteen seventy. So, um, I had um, um, Buford Smith was the first one who took Roy's old gallery over. And he let me know about this um, empty studio uh, place next to him. I got that place and there were two floors available. And one floor was $50. No, the, the second, second floor was $50 and the top floor was $75 and vice versa. And, but the point was that you, um, who else was it? Um, Ray Francis. And Lou Draper had a gallery across the street. A studio around the corner, yeah. Right. No, directly across the street. Okay. Because we could look in in each other's window. And um, Herb Robinson had a studio there. So in 1970s, wind up, uh, what, five or six of us wound up on Sixth Avenue. So we go from from Harlem to Sixth Avenue. So that's how this portfolio started because... I I was leaving after about 10 years in the gallery. The rents went up from that $75 a month to $3,000 a month. And so I had to go. And I had a place where I was going to move into. Sean, could I just say something? Could we go back to the first slide? Sure. Go back to it. Back to number one? Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Just leave leave the title up too, so we know what we're talking about too. Leave the title up. The title. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we are. That you know, here all those Harlem guys now wind up on Sixth Avenue, and Thirty Eighth Street, and um, I'm I'm gonna have to leave because of I can't afford the rents anymore. My uh, girlfriend at the time. We had made plans to rent uh, a floor in a brownstone with a brother up in Harlem. Excuse me. But that deal fell through. So I'm at a loss that I have two floors worth of stuff that I have no place to put. I had two boxes, three boxes of prints that I had printed for exhibition. So these prints were prints for exhibition. And at the time, Debbie Willis was working at the Schomburg. So I went up and asked her, listen, I got to move. I don't want to travel with these photographs. I don't know what condition they're going to wind up in. So could you take them, hold them for me? 
She said, yes. And I never got, and it was what, 50 years, maybe 55 years passed by before I found, finally got to um, uh, get the get the photographs back. And it was interesting because I remember Bruce and I had been running into each other and talking about with one thing or another. And I happened to say, yeah, well, I, I have these 50 or more. And I and actually didn't even know how many photographs they were. I knew they, I thought they were about 26. But there actually were how many photographs were about a hundred and something, eighty. All right, so there were eighty photographs there that I had I'd forgotten pretty much about. And he made a call, and they said, "Come pick up your photographs." So that's so how it, it was really, lost, then found. It was lost, then found. Okay. Nobody else knew about them. I think um, what's her name, um, Mary Yearwood. Right. She was the one who found them. Okay. She was the one who I first started to talk to about, hey, what about these fronts that I, I put here for safekeeping? And she found them and they were trying to figure out whether they, that they, whether they still belong to me or not. So uh, we weren't going back and forth and then she resigned and other people resigned. So it got complex, but Bruce was able to call and say, hey, you go pick up your prints. Mm, okay. Well, could you tell us now about the sequences? Because we have separate groups of them too. And I think we were one one series is West 117th Street. Right. 17th we, Street. We, we can black. start going through them now, I think. Yeah, we can start with the photographs now. This is one of the characters out of the block. They were characters in 117th Street. Uh, he was one of the characters. I, I guess he was one of the drinkers. Um, you know, at the time, we didn't know much about liquor. So we knew about wines, local wines, you know, chemical wines, <laughs> we could call them. He was one of the, the local guys that hung out and did odd jobs. I guess you could call it odd job guy. And I would get a pocket full of film and, and leave my building to go normally to 125th Street. That was the main thoroughfare back then. It still is. It was the main stopping center for Black people in, in the Harlem area. So I would go up there to shoot. But there were so many characters in my block that I never got off the block at some point. So there's a lot of the portfolio that I turned over to the library um, that had, you know, most of 117th Street, a larger part of the portfolio was 117th Street. Okay. None of these photographs were done on assignments. I think the only thing was drugs was pretty much, it wasn't an assignment, but it developed into assignment after I took them down and I was going to go in park. saw him. he didn't think much of them. Um, but I showed him some, someone else there and they kind of liked them and said, Hey, listen, why don't you do more? So I did it. It was the first time I did a story. That was my first okay. page story. Actually. Could, could we go through with some comments and some of the photographs? That you have? This is again, this is 119th street. So I'm shooting between 116th Street to 125th Street, maybe to 8th Avenue, maybe to Park Avenue. That was kind of the walking range that I kind of did and walked around and, and felt very comfortably taking pictures. Now, this is in the 60s, 70s. It, these were done. And I guess this was the first time I thought that I came out of the school with Roger Garaba that was, you know, taking photographs of people in a positive light, trying to show this, that there's, there's a fun in this community. It's not as downtrodden and downbeat as, as we're being pictured as. But I saw this little girl in the bars was significant to me because at some point, that we all were in this prison that we were unconscious of. So it was the first time I started to do editorial and started to talk about um, what I want this picture to represent. So, I mean, that was pretty much, it was the first time I did it. I could have I could have gotten, I went down in the basement to shoot her from this angle instead of just shooting her from the street, getting out of the basement and shooting her from the street angle. Mm -hmm. Can we see the next up? Street life. Drugs changed the whole community around. I come out of a, com a community. I lived in 117th Street for 30 years. 
So my mother was just me and my brother. My mother could send us downstairs and let us play and the neighborhood would watch us. So it wasn't, you know, so I remember when we wanted to smoke, start smoking cigarettes, we had to go four or five blocks away. And even because if any neighbor caught us trying to smoke cigarettes on the street, man, they, they could, and they actually had permission to beat you, then take you home and let your mother beat you. So we, we were a pure neighborhood, but drugs came in. And these are the guys I hung out with. Now, this wasn't an assignment. These are the guys that I'm hanging with. What this is, what's happening here is, is most people don't realize this is a matchbook he has. And the paper part of the matchbook, you could fold over and maybe what we call it was a quill. So you can now use that as a makeshift shovel to shovel the stove up your nose. So that's what this shot was coming out of my building, I guess, too. And like I say, these were guys that I was hanging out with. So they weren't just people that I picked off the streets that I wouldn't I wouldn't get to that close in that situation with people I didn't know. Well, it's too close. Well, that, I mean, that's the other point, because I had a lot of reflection about this, whether to show this series or not. Mm-hmm. This suicide in, what is this? I got to look the date, 1970. Yeah, so that's 50 years ago. 50 yeah, years. Now, I've been playing with, I mean, you know, we guys grew up, to element, we came out of elementary school together, so that's what I mean by grow up. We might have mm-hmm. been 50 years younger, older. But at some point, drugs went from... All of us that like there were guys that were wine holes. After the Second World War, you got all these guys coming home from the military. And um, what was it? Morphine was the thing to kill the pain for all the injuries that they had had. Then on top of that, Vietnam came in. So now you got morphine and now the Indo-Chinese come in with all this heroin and and morphine, but mostly heroin It's processed there. They're bringing it here processed already. So I like lived in 117th Street between Lennox and 7th was like a drug marketplace. That and the police had nothing to say much about it. We, they would go get online to buy the drugs. If they were good drugs, they would be online to buy these drugs. And the police cars would drive by because everybody was getting paid off. So could we go through some more? Yeah. You know, because I lived in the next block over from you. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> and, and so it was know. 1968 and drugs were everywhere. <clears throat> yeah, and people don't realize it because now, what is it? Um, what's the drug that they're, uh, the pills that they're by second? Uh-huh. No. Um, oxycodone? Oxycodone. That's the new heroin was oxycodone because everybody got strung out because I'm, I'm, I'm coming, you know, wait a minute. I thought we got, I thought we beat that game. You know, that thing war on, we always had a war on drugs, a war on crime, but I thought that we had won the war on drugs until oxy came around and they figured that, you know, cause I, I did a thing in Virginia and had an all white audience and it's full of white folks. And I kind of said to them, you know, finally, you, you guys, this has touched your lives like it's touched our lives. You know, these black folks were really abused by this. And at one time, it was just something, it was a habit. But now it's, it's an addiction. So it became addiction when white folks started to get strung out on it. But it was a habit, a bad habit that we chose to get into. Go to the next one. Could we could we stroll through some of the photographs too? Next. This is a funny photograph. First of all, the name of the market is funny because it's right on the corner of 116th Street and uh, Lenox Avenue. What these cops have on, many people might not recognize them, but what they were were. Air Raid Warden hats. Do anybody remember those yellow hats they used to wear that had some kind of an air raid, something to do with a nuclear bomb and stuff on them? Uh, I forgot what exactly the symbol was, but it was a kind of gentler world at that time because these guys didn't have any gear. They didn't have the gear that these guys have for rice. These guys were 
you know, they were on post in case the riots broke out further down, but they started on 125th Street. And um, they wanted, they were down, so this is 116th Street. But I, I look at this and always remember now, because when you see cops with riot gear now, that that's not cop gear, that's military gear. So, I mean, they have military rise, militarized up to the ninth compared to what guys had to do if there was a riot broken out of a crowd, crowd or a mob scene situated. All they had to protect them was, was a, you know, they had their guns in their village, but primarily all they had was these hats. So I always thought it was very funny. And the other thing about this photograph is the prices. Everybody look at the prices. I went to the store and bought everything but meat, and I spent a hundred and some odd dollars. I just bought fruit and vegetables and stuff like that, and I couldn't imagine. Look at this. 59 so, cents a pound, huh? Yeah. So you know, this is good. Next. Next slide. Oh, okay. This is in 117th Street. It was one of the few vacant lots. There were only about two vacant lots in 117th Street. The rest of it, it was, you know, it was a fully developed um, situation. I, I mean, it was mixed uh, economics. Um, fortunately, I came out of a middle-class family. I didn't realize I was middle class until I was damn near 40 years old. And somebody told me that, oh, you was only you and your brother and you had two working parents. And my father had a, a union job. So that so was- These are that. beautiful prints though, Sean. Danny, the one thing that impressed me so much about these photographs was one, what I had learned from Kamonge, and two, that I had learned that much that early on. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the quality the of the still glow. Yeah, the quality of the prints I think still hold up now. You know, and I feel proud that at least because when you see a work of mine, I'm representing a group of guys. Kamonge was my sobon, and I keep saying that. You know, I could have went to Paris and couldn't have learned more about photography than I did learn in Harlem working with Kamonge. Right. Next. Next. Another one of the uh, wine consuming guys that hung out in the block. These guys kind of ran errands, you know, carried stuff, you know, carried groceries upstairs for, you know, to get some extra money to do, you know, to satisfy their needs. Next. Two main buddies. This is next door to me. 128 is the next building. I'm one building further down. Um, two guys that I hung out with quite a bit. And I know, I think they might still be alive. I'm not sure. But there were so many guys that I grew up with because of drugs primarily. This took them out of the picture. And that's why for me that, but I was showing this series of photographs and what I was showing, the, the, the influence that drugs had on the community would be not for me being, you know, not telling the truth, not, um, you know, revisionist, you know, when you people, you know, I'd be a revisionist by taking the drugs out of Harlem and act like, yeah, and, and talk about it passion, passively, because it was a plague. It, it was like any science fiction viruses, like they poured some chemicals and they said, here, take this chemical. And I kept asking one of the guys that I, you know, I said, hey man, I'm not gonna go that way. I'm not gonna shoot any drugs. I'm not gonna do that because at some point I had dreams about being something. I didn't know what I was gonna be, but I thought I was gonna be something. But up until I made certain decisions in my life, these are the guys that I hung out. Well, I'm again, Sean, I'm like, what's what point out those skin tones? I'm incredibly glow to them. Beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, again, Danny, I was impressed when I saw them, but I knew that these were exhibition quality prints. And that's why I still had other prints that I took with me on my lone journey, so journey to find an apartment. 
But Pardon? these were the ones that I knew were what I considered master prints. And that's, that funny, that's, that's one of the things that um, Derek Walcott used to talk about. There's not enough self-amazement in art, you know, so it's funny to look back and say, wow, I did that. Good God. You know, yeah. Good. You know, and like I said, this is before. I think so we're going to have to go through it at a quicker pace to, to make sure. Yeah, uh, we had to go through these a little faster. Sure. Another two guys that I hung out with. So the two guys on the street were two guys. And this is the after fact of the two guys that both of them were in a restaurant and they couldn't even sit up to get to, to order what they wanted to order. And both of these guys are dead now. Right. Front, the front brother was really a close buddy. I mean, we ran together for a while, a long while, years. Next. What, and again, this is on the stoop 128 again. Um, I don't. I mean, this is a young black boy with a white doll. So there's not much they could say about that. It was just, you know, I think he had a lot of girls in his family. That's part, part of it. But I thought it was just, uh, I thought it brought up a lot of conversation about what is going on with this. You know, you got to remember, uh, I, in a relationship, I bought a, um, my girlfriend's other kid a, a car. She's a girl, and I bought her a car. And people kept saying, why did you buy you a car? I mean, but your mother drives. I mean, why wouldn't she play with cars? Like, and people thought, no, you buy them dolls. You don't buy little girls' cars. So they might be telling this kid the same thing. Well, you should have a car. You shouldn't have a doll. <laughs> you know? I don't know. But again, 128, next door to me. Haps, that's his brother's name. I knew this brother <clears throat> when he was driving the Cadillac, when I met him. And this is how he wound up. All right, next. Ah. Primitive, but that's what it was doing at the time. Soda bottles, soda, well, liquor top, matchbook. And this is how you cook the drugs. <clears throat> so the problem of, uh, of infection was insane. That was the other thing, too, that most of the drug addicts, and what I mean by drug addicts, these guys that shot drugs, most of them that got lived through that had all kinds of abscesses and all kinds of problems with their skin because of the conditions that they shot these drugs under. Right. Again, I promised these guys that I would never show their faces. I, that's why I printed them dark. This is my man. This is Scotty. There's another photograph of Scotty. Scotty, I think Scotty was another drinker of wine, but he washed cars. He was an independent entrepreneur. This is private enterprise and no taxes. You didn't have to pay any taxes, but he was good at his job. That's why he had this big baby carriage because he had this is my shot. This is probably one of the first shots that I did in 117th Street that I really loved. And again, this is Scotty. And now he went from that to now he's got his office. It was one of the abandoned buildings. So he set up his little cabinet and he could be found and, and you could see what he did, you know, clean cars, wax, do everything. But he was one of the characters that I've shot regularly because they would change daily. Okay, next. Park Avenue, this is under the L. And there's a place called, it used to be a place called La Maqueta that ran from 116th Street and Park Avenue to down to at least 114th Street. Now this is under the Elm. And they had stores under the Elm, so they had fish markets, meat markets, fruit markets. And that's where my mom used to take me to shop. That's where we shopped at. That was the one of the places that we bought food from. It was and like going to the Caribbean too, Sean. Pardon me? It was like going to the Caribbean. 
Oh yeah, it was it was the only market that that was the time that Harlem did have a market, right? And I would you know I would go back there periodically just to take photographs. And all of that debris is that from the guys inside throwing their boxes, fruit boxes, and all the stuff that they're selling inside. That was what the debris was. So that was cleared away. Well, every day, or if not, you know, on a regular basis, it wasn't something that stayed there regularly. Hmm. Can't think of the brother's name right now, huh? One of my favorite photographs. He's <laughs> one of my, this brother took. He took Scotty's position, so he's a another wine drinker. But what it was that I don't know how many suits he had because he come out every Sunday he wore a suit, but every during the week he wore everything. You know, sometimes I had a shot with him with a burlap bag over his head. I mean, so it went from those extremes. But this is a family member of his, and he was sent out that hey, you watch the kid. That he was a such of of consciousness of mind that he could watch that kid and nobody's going to do anything to that kid. But you could see that it was almost like that they're they're in two different places, they're in two different worlds. But don't touch the kid. Yeah, but he's right. also taking care to put a piece of paper under it when he sits on oh, the yeah. Stage. Oh yeah, and put a piece of under her too. Right. Yeah, and we ain't gonna get our clothes dirty, dear. This is one of the things that I did do on the east side. Now, it was interesting that there were no boundaries. The only boundaries that I saw growing up was after Park Avenue. So Park, after you got to Park Madison, then, you know, probably once you got to First, Second, Second Avenue, it was the Italian neighborhood. So that was one of the places you didn't kind of just roam with a camera. Benjamin Franklin was in um, Pleasant Avenue, which was the last street before you hit the highway and then the water. And I went there and it was the time, first time that I was called the N-word. And I understood I was called the N-word and you either had to deal with that or just get beat up. I mean, so I decided I wasn't gonna get beat up. It wasn't that important. But we got to, me and three other brothers kind of worked out some kind of truth there's a local um, eatery there, sandwich joint, Italian sandwich joint. And they, for whatever reason, I guess because we, I don't know, but they allowed us to come in and eat. And we could go in there and eat our sandwiches and keep our little group. We didn't, you know, we didn't socialize with any of the other guys. We didn't try to make friends with them. We just said, hey, we got a peaceful place to eat. We'll eat our food. We can hang for a minute before we go back to school. So that was kind of the area. So this is an area I felt comfortable with. And that was a deal for me growing up, walking around with camera. I you never could, had... You could also hear Tito Rodriguez. You know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, a friend of mine, um, these were two young men that she was dealing with in some kind of program. And she said, oh, I'm going to take my two friends out and just walk around. Would you like to hang out with us? And that's how these photographs came about. This particular photograph was used for an ad. I can't remember what ad it was used, but it was the first time one of my photographs was used for an ad. Um, and there's another shot of the two of them. There was another Latino brother that, that hung out with us. Classic, 125th Street. Now, 125th Street is where if you, you know, at that time and even at this time, photographers still go to 125th Street in the summertime. You go to 125th Street, you find this likely spot and you squat and you stay there. And everything's going to pass your way. And um, this is during the period of the hula hoops. Does anyone remember? Because I have 1960s. Anybody remember? Well, you guys don't remember hula hoops, so I don't know. But they, they were very popular at the time, even in black neighborhoods, they got very, very popular, right? So this one, I, I haven't really liked this. I like the movement in this. There's something very musical about this shot. And then the circular, the hula hoops, and that they, and he's, he's obviously, 
the amount of them that he has, he plans to sell at least most of those before he gets back home. So it was showed you about some sense about the neighborhood and the popularity of these things, and they were cheap. I can't even remember what they were, but they were either enough cheap that a kid could ask their parents to buy one. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the Columbus Day Parade. There were two shots that I did Columbus Day Parade. And she was the only thing that stood, it's really kind of stood out to me. I didn't, it was the first that I began to start to shoot parades. So this is my, my first attempt at it. And she was the first, maybe I'm the first part of the only thing that caught, really caught my eye and that has stood up for all these years. Um, and I try not to pose people, but she kind of posed for me. And I try to keep people, catch people unaware of me that I try to catch pictures of them before they realize that I've taken a picture of them. I, I'm a fan. I mentioned I, uh, Roy DiCarava, but I didn't mention the other photographer. And I have to say that he's cut their person off. I um, found that the way he approached photography uh, was to my liking that you catch people in that particular moment that you don't say, could you stop? Could I please, could I, I'd like to take, I don't do that back and forth dialogue. I, I can't work with that. I wanna catch them because what happens with people with ca when they see cameras, women do something with the hair, men do something. We all kind of, we do something to ourselves because for, for whatever it is, like we are, we're not good enough for the camera. So I wanna, I wanna be my best for this picture. And I try to catch them before they get to that point. It's another beautiful print, boy. Ah, thank you. Oh, this is the two of the kids um, together. Yes. <laughs> this is my this is my my, my political poster. <laughs> yeah. And the and the brother was very interested. He just looked at me, trying to figure out what I was doing or why I was taking a picture of him. So I didn't, I didn't, there was no words passed between him and I. I snapped a picture, I might have snapped two or three. Uh, my thing is, I, I taught um, um, college for about, what, 40, 40 years or so. The last place I taught was um, City College. But I used to always tell my people, one of the things that Katya Prasad used to say, well, you know, one shot is it. That's all you need is one shot. And I found that not for me, and not for most people. Not for uh, him either. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you remember he used to talk that one shot. you see you realize he shoot more than yes. one shot. Yeah, because I say, the, if you can catch the one, grab the first shot you can. But if it stays there, whatever form it is, you grab as many shots as you can. That's what you're supposed to do. Get as many shots as you can. This is when the neighborhood, this is when drugs like really got in full effect. You know that, I'm, you know, Danny, there weren't, there weren't a lot of vacant lots and empty places. I mean, the neighborhood was really safe. But then you start to find out a lot of burnouts. And there's a whole history of right after Heron came the, um, they started in the Bronx, but the uh, landlords started burning out because they burnt out the Bronx. I mean, everybody knows about, they burnt out the Bronx. You go up in seventies, eighties, you go up in the Bronx and you actually look like Germany. It looked like they had bombed the area. And that was the landlords. Now that we realize the value of our property, we couldn't get you out with the heroin. So now we've got you in such a bad condition that you can't fight us because you're trying to get you fixed that we're going to burn you out. And that's when you start to see scenes like this, which was really, it was really mind blowing because it was like, I never grew up in source of anything like that growing up. You know, we used to walk to school. Yeah. yeah. We're going to change the pace a little bit too so we can get to see some more images. Okay, sure. Park Avenue, young boy, and now he's being taught by his grandmother. He can tell this is his grandmother and teaching him the business. Okay, favorite shot. This is one of my Halloween photographs. Uh, I did a lot of stuff on Halloween. So I've been, now to do my work is I do it in series. So I have a parade series, I have a Halloween series, and I do things annually. 
I go out and shoot these particular occasions. I, I don't shoot much in the streets now anymore. It's just not a, it's not a place to be marching around with a camera anymore. But I like this and that decisive, and that's what I meant particularly about a decisive moment. Somebody asked me at the opening, what does this picture represent? And I told him it was a numbers joint. I don't know if anybody knows what a numbers joint, but this is a number where people went in to write the numbers, to gamble, to bet on numbers, to bet on the track. I guess that's what numbers were about, betting on the track. And the wind never changed for 10, 15 years. It never changed. And I, I, it just sort of says that you know, 1980s, this woman still, this window still looked the same as it did in the 1960s. Yeah. Go ahead. My first Halloween shot, maybe the first or second, but I was coming out of Brooklyn, and this is one of my first Halloween shot. That braid again. It is one beautiful shot, too, Sean. Yes. I was lucky, and it was another thing. I don't know if you used it, Danny, but I got used to, you know, Lou, Lou particularly Lou Draper turned us all on to turned us all on to potassium ferrous cyanide. Do you remember that? Of course. <laughs> yeah. So this is the first time shot that I learned how to use potassium ferrous cyanide. Great again. This is another one of parade. I thought it was an interesting black woman with a, an Indian outfit on. I thought that was really cool. Just, you know, and again, even though I don't want people to be posed, they pose for you. I mean, you know, she's hanging out the window, <laughs> but, but, but she's on the, um, she's on the first floor. So she's not high up in the building where some danger to her. She's on the first floor. How do you get to Cuba, Sean? Third Well Newsreel, which is now called Newsreel. Um, again, I would, that's when I became an emotion picture cameraman, 35 millimeter um, film. And uh, no, 16 millimeters, sorry. We were doing 16 millimeter film at the time. And they were one of those group of the Third World Newsreel to go. And the guy, Alan Siegel, because like I told you, we became very tight. He demanded that I go because I would be the only black representative, right, representative of the group. And since they were supposed to be so radical, how could you be so radical and you ain't got no black people in here? So he demanded that, hey, Sean should go. And plus, he's the best cameraman here. So that's how I went to Cuba. Then we went to shoot a, a film on the Isle of, Pan, um, Isle of Pines which was a, uh, an island, <laughs> there was an island that they were building a hotel and a, a, con a casino for the white gamblers, because it's pretty much Italian. It was, this is during the time when the Italians were down there, ran it pretty much, that they were building where the guys could come to, to gamble and the women could come to have abortions. So that's what this casino was all about. So when Castro came in, he you know stopped it. So it's an interesting. It's the only thing on the island. It's a big, fabulous casino with nobody in it other than Cubans. They would take their, their, their what is it? Their vacations. They would come to the island pines. So they were on their way on the ferry. And they changed it into a youth camp. Yeah. Oh, that's what they did. Okay. Yeah. I, this is the first time I've seen a brother with a gun that bit. You know, I, I came out of a neighborhood that everybody had pistols, but didn't necessarily have, I mean, and I'd never seen that. And I, I was impressed by it. This is a, um, um, a rally, Castro spoke. I did photographs of Castro, but they don't happen to be in this group. And uh, it was a uh, six or seven hours he spoke. Right. He's notorious for that. You know, yeah. They're not leave. One of my favorite shots. You know, when I was going to going to Cuba and I kept asking people, what am I, what am I supposed to 
adjust my head to what am I supposed to look for? What am I going to be presented with? And nobody could give me an answer. But once you go there, you realize that all you have to do, all somebody had to do is tell me to the South. And I would have understood Cuba or Goyerine. You know, hey, this is farmers. You know, my man got a chicken. He's gone home. This is dinner. I'm going home. I just finished work. I'm going home to eat dinner. Another one. I just, the Cubans kind of kind of uptight with me because I didn't photograph some of the newer buildings that they were doing. And I did them because of there's something about the aesthetics. And I, I mean, look how huge that window is. You, you know, I'm a New Yorker, you just don't see windows that big. So it was more about that and the, the and the different types of straw hats that they wore. Yeah. So I enjoyed it. So these, the are two, uh, huh, these were all the couple waiting for the ferry to go. So they just fell asleep. We were at the airport and I got these 35 millimeter, um, 16 millimeter camera, 16 and 35. I uh, this 16 millimeter camera and the plane or whatever, no, maybe the boat or plane, whatever it was that was delayed. And so the guy, the guide with us said, leave. You leave the camera, leave the film, leave all that stuff there. We're going to go to the restaurant. So I, I kind of got very hesitant, couldn't figure out what that was about. But then the restaurant was way across the field somewhere. And I kept saying, man, I, and he kind of saw that I was anxious. He said, listen, you're in Cuba. Don't worry about your stuff. It'll be there when we get back. And I understood that, oh, okay, but I can't, I can't keep this same mentality once I get back to the United States or else I'd be beat. Next shot. Went down to visit a friend, another brother from Guyana. Said, hey, man, come on down. Uh, I got... Uh, went to Cuba and I got on the FBI's list. Really bizarre. I, you know, I didn't tell much people about it, but I was on the FBI. I got blacklisted, I guess. So I couldn't get a job. When I got back to the United States, I was working for Black Journal. I was working for Newsreel. I was working for several different com uh, companies doing freelance camera work. And I couldn't get a job to save my life. Me and my, they, my, they fired my wife. They, she had a job as a social worker. So we got jammed up pretty badly. So one of the brothers from um, Kamonga said, listen, we are down here, come on down. Maybe you can get a job down here. So that's what I went to Guyana for because I was so desperate that I couldn't get a job in the United States that I went to Guyana to get work. For me, Guyana was for me, one of my best photographic trips. Uh, I was there long enough to just shoot every day. Ray Francis had, um, I don't know if you were in the group when he developed, found this formula called, of Stockless, this German developer. Did you, were you familiar with that, Danny? Yeah, I was. He found this formula in, in an old um, German chemical book called Stockless. He made the formula up. And what the thing did, it, it read, Continuous, it was like a continuous tone developer. And there was always separation, whether he's in he's inside. And as you know, the, the light when you're in the sun and the, whatever's in back of you goes dark. This chemical just read. It just it never stopped reading the scale. And that's what I liked about the photographs that I did here and the ones that I printed it were easy to print. Easy, easiest photographs I had to print. You're talking about a paper developer or a film developer? It was a film developer. Right. And didn't realize that how much, but I guess any poor country anywhere in the world has got a gambling parlor or many of them. I really didn't know that gambling was such a, a major thing down there. You know, I thought that was statewide, but I figured that any place you go, you're going to find a gambling parlor. It's a racing service. Yeah, but that's what gambling. That's what know, just funny how that's put, numbers. Right. That's it. Oh, I wonder if we could go back to uh, one, one more the, the 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 Halloween piece, the ghost piece. Is it possible to go back to that? 
Yeah, that's right. Okay. John, I love those prints. Thank you. Could you talk about the exhibit too? Where it is and how, is it, is it down now? No, it's gonna be up until this weekend. It'll be up this weekend. Okay. And it's at the uh, Bruce Silverstein up. Gallery? Right here? It's at the Bruce Silverstein Gallery. Oh, yes, at the Bruce Silverstein Gallery. That's um, um, 20th Street, I think that's 529. 29. Yeah. Ruth and I have been running into places over the years. And um, he just happened to call me when I just told me I had this set of prints and, you know, that, you, you know, that I'd like to see and would he like to see him. And that's how we got this together. All right, so it was like something, a really quick turnaround because I didn't expect the show. He wasn't interested to do with the show. So it came out of nowhere. He felt enough about the work that he felt that it should be exhibited. Yeah, this is another favorite shot. Mm -hmm. This started me on the Halloween series. Yeah, but also that ferrocyanide really, really makes it pop too, just, you know. Just a, just a beautiful print too. Again, Sean, because you have ability to hold those details in the highlights. You know, so. Oh, you don't know how many prints I've printed in before. Right. <laughs> yes, right. You don't know how many of those before. You know. and, and like I said, uh, the, uh, using the, because uh, it was one of those prints that I put aside that I'm not going to be able to print this because it was really late in the afternoon going towards, going towards evening. And it just wasn't enough separation, but this is this is a daytime shot, so you can see the leaves on the ground and everything like that. The other thing we uh, Kamonge had a whole concept of um, what's it? I um, uh, can't think of the painter now, but we were always into this caroscuro kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, Cavazio, yeah, Cavazio, and well, we always printed for drama. This is on a six paper. People used to say, what? Good God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Come on, it was on, we were printing on six papers. So that's why this thing looks like it's floating. I mean, it really took on another a life that when I looked at it, I said, wow, I never expected to, wouldn't. if you saw the negative, like I said, it's, it's still daylight, but putting it on the six paper and made this white sheet stand out and make everything else go black. Um, I I loved working on the print. It's so funny because Roy, one of your influences was printing a number one paper. You know, Roy used to print on one, and we there was right. always a problem about how we because we were printing on these four, and some of us went up to six. So that was mm -hmm. three was out of the question. You no, know, you can't print anything. That's not printable, right? We were looking for the the, the drama of that. There's a um. Um, what was the movie? I'm trying to think of the um, the filmmaker that did um, Virgin Springs. Anybody ever seen Virgin Springs? Nobody ever seen that movie. You know Virgin Springs, Danny. Don't remember it. Uh, you don't remember it? Oh, I read about Surprises and Whispers. Oh, yeah. Who was that by? The Czech filmmaker? Uh, you know, yeah, Swedish. Oh, not big by Bergman. Bergman. Thank you, dear. Bergman. That was where we were, you know, Bergman, uh, everybody, if you haven't seen that movie, Cries and Whispers, terrible, but film-wise, it's beautiful. It's probably, and it was one of the first films that Bergman did in color. Yeah, that was Sven, Sven Negris. Pardon me? Sven Negris was his cameraman. Oh, okay. Right, but he did, and, and, and Virgin Springs was another one that we all had saw, mm -hmm. and that's how we began to follow him. Um, and it was a lighting that he did that was in, it was really incredible. It was like all the Flemish painters and you know, and the Dutch painters. I mean, they painted light like none of the other painters that I've realized that that's where we were. I guess that's the school that we were coming from. And drama, I thought, um, it was a film noir. I grew up in what I, you know, film while all the old detective movies I grew up looking at and the Frankenstein movies and the Dracula movies, all that pretty much film noir. But I thought film noir meant a type of lighting. And I thought they were talking about the lighting that they use and the shadows that they use and the dramatic, you know, that you could see a thing happen 
and you can only see it in shadow. They didn't have to show the real thing itself. And I found out that um, that, that was about gangster movies. <laughs> That's what film was it's about. It's about gangster Sean, stories and detective stories. Sean, I wonder if we could we could take some questions too, if there are any. Sure. Can I ask you, Sean, what was your relationship like with Lou Draper? What was it like to work with Lou and how you know, his teaching technique? Because you mentioned that he was really, a, you know, you learned some printing from Lou. Oh, I went to. One of the things that Lou was mild, we called him mild mannered. We had, you know, because they had a lot of characters. Lou was mild mannered and, and he kind of kept things down. But I went to him to print, and Lou was the only one that printed on the floor. So you had to have good knees. I just all I remember, but Lou had a photograph that we looked at of a plain white sheet. Do you remember that white sheet that Lou showed? Mm -hmm. And then everybody looked at that sheet, and, every, and after you saw Lou Draper's sheet photograph, that you never looked at a sheet again the same way in your life. And I mean, that was the kind of printer he was, that he affected everybody. And I went to um, Ray Francis. Al, Al Finau was another printer. I went all the way out to Inglewood, New Jersey. I had to spend the night just to, to learn to get them to catch these guys when they print. And he was a, a light printer and stuff like this. So they were all amenable. They respected the fact that, hey, if you want to learn this, I'll show it to you. And not, I couldn't, you know, it was, it was sort of like, it was the best kind of class you could go to where, come on, man, let me show you this. Come over. And I went to Azure's place. I went to Ray's place. I went to Lou's place. Uh, who else did I suppose from these two? Uh, Carly Nancy went to Buford and her, I went to everybody's place to learn how to print. That was the deal. So those, those prints that you see, uh, some, some, some were a group of learning from Kamonga. And I felt about that because I felt that these photographs represented the quality that I was taught in Kamonga. You know, that when you, when you show a, a print all of work, that you represent the group that you come from. You represent the school that you went to. And I always feel strongly and I feel very secure about, hey, my, this print represents what I learned in Kamonga. All right. Christine, were there some other questions? Yeah, we have one question in the chat um, from Marilyn. Mm -hmm. did, you, did Sean ever photograph Harry Bedstaff? That's Marilyn Nance, Sean. Did I photograph who? Yeah. No, because it didn't happen when I was down there. Oh, uh, you're talking about in Guyana. Yeah, I, 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 that was another thing that was supposed to happen, but it didn't happen. I, I didn't, I didn't manage to do that. I went to Nigeria to do another, you know, international f festival, but that was not happening. That happened in '68. But I know these guys went to. Um, was the other thing they went to in Nigeria earlier? Fesback. Fesback. Yeah. In fact, in fact, Marilyn's book is about that. Yeah, I don't even know how I missed Fesback. I'm still trying to figure out what I was doing, what, where I was at that I didn't even. Know. I know how I missed it, Sean. I had a job. You know. So. Oh. Is that what it was? So That's what it was. That's why I didn't job, know. I didn't even hear about it until afterwards. Mm. You know, and the reason why I'm saying that because we all looking for work. If we don't have work, we're out there looking for it. Yeah, Ed Spriggs put together the visual art component. Ed, Ed Spriggs and Jeff Donaldson. Okay, okay. Uh, is there any other questions? No, I have a question though. What, how long were you in Guyana for? You were saying, would you travel back and forth from New York? Would you no, no, I stayed there for only months, several months, three or four months. No, but no, once, you, <laughs> once you're there, you stay. I, I, cause I, I went down to get a job with the, um, some administration down there and you can get two year, you can, at the time you can get year contracts like you, and I think they're still happening that you can sign yourself up to a con to a country to teach whatever, you know, well for a year and they give you a house and a car and you kind of do that kind of number. But, um, because I had my son Bingham was the president, right? Hmm? Bingham was the president, I think at the time. 
Yeah. And he was inviting African Americans to come down. He was, oh, yeah. A lot of people. Sonny Carson was down. Uh, mm -hmm. What's her name? That Because we were just talking about it. They tore down her place on uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, the African, the thing that they, she did, um, um, the building on 125th Street and Fifth Avenue. The old studio museum? No. Where the oh, old oh, studio Barbara museum? Antier, Barbara Antier. She was down there. Sonny yeah. Carson was down there. A, a bunch of folks. Tom Feelings were down and, there. And Jimmy, Jimmy Manis was there for a Jimmy long time. Jimmy Manis was there. Uh, so it was, hey, it was happening at the time. And what happened was that most of the guys, the older guys that were down there had left Ghana. So they had left Ghana and they weren't ready to come back to New York. So they went to Guyana and they were like, you know, following the you know, socialist nationalist kind of movement. And that's what was happening in Guyana. And so it was, a, it was a nice place to stay. And they wanted Americans down to teach mainly artists and dance they had people come down to teach out and dance and and the well, art. lavinia williams was teaching dance there too right and yeah Gemma catherine dunham too yeah yeah i think forbes burnham had invited a whole slew of african-american artists to come down right yeah yeah because some even uh what was the other group uh i can't think of um uncle pie what was uncle pie's group named we you see why you see yeah some of the why you see painters were down there too when mm -hmm. i was down there you know so it was it was like being at an old, old homework in an old home week in another country. I mean, um, it was really, you know, so I got a chance to do, uh, like I said, I think I did some of the best photography I did in my yeah. career. Sean, so, you know, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Mattis had me come down to work on one of his films. He was working yeah. on a feature there. And it, there was a co-director from Guyana. And it turned out he was my cousin. You know, a cousin I didn't know who I was about to insult. You know? Yeah. I mean, and the other thing, interesting thing about Kamoinge is that we wound up all over the world at some points, you know. Uh, I went to, what, seven, eight countries, mainly for what I learned in Kamoinge. Uh, his brother Jimmy Manis lived in Guyana. Uh, all of us lived in different places for periods of time. Did you ever and, go to Africa? Yeah, I went okay. to Nigeria. I went to okay. Senegal and went to Ethiopia. I went to someplace else, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't got to Europe. That was the only place I haven't got to. Yeah, I keep not thinking. too late. It's not too late. <laughs> no, I got to go to Japan. No, that's, I'm ready for it. Anybody knows any trips going to Japan, if they pay the way I go. You know what I'm saying? Well, you, can, you can go to, go to the shrine. Have a wheelchair, go. <laughs> go, to, go to the shrine of Cardia Brisson, though, you know, in Paris. Yeah, I listen to this. I, I, you know, I have to tell you that. Out of the and, and Manetta Sleet is another mm -hmm. photographer that we never give the tenant tension that he deserves. And he's like, you know, the sleeping sleeping dragon. But Manetta Sleet was one of the baddest unknown photographers around. So you always hear about everybody else, but you never hear the Manetta Sleet's name mentioned. He was also one of the nicest people on the planet, too. So yes, but you know how me and Manetta met? I was gonna put my camera in the pawn shop. And he was taking his out of the pawn shop. That's a weird <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, he was a chief photographer for, for Johnson Publications. Yes, for I know. Almost 40 years, you know. So. Yeah, but do you know, do you remember the big show he had at the public library on 42nd Street? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's when I found out who Miss Manana Sleep was. He, he, he also won a Pulitzer for that portrait. Pardon me? He won a Pulitzer for that portrait of um, on, um, uh, yeah. Coretta Scott King. King yes. But he's still, nobody knows his name. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't even know Roy's name, but I mean, Manetta Sleet, I mean, photographers don't know his brother's name, unfortunately. Uh, any other questions? No, that was the only question. There's uh, one more question that just came in from Leticia Barbosa. She asks, any advice for young photographers or any life lessons? in photography you'd like to pass along? Wow, good question. <laughs> you know, it's, um, and she's doing, you know, I see her, she's, a, you know, her father, because he was another community member, Tony. Um, it's harder now than it was when we were coming up because there were issues that we could grab a hold to and be a part of. And because of the whole civil rights thing movement was going on, there was a lot of Pan-Africanism going on. So there were a lot of movements 
that you could get into and get practice shooting. I tell people, young folks now, one thing you have to do is get good at what you do. The one way you do it is practice. Parades for me was practice. I could always practice my timing. And that's what I felt because I'm shooting in the streets. Now, if you're shooting portraitures, you got another head. But for my style of shooting, that's what I practice. Now, I don't, I don't even know the publications. I mean, at least there were a bunch of publications. We could at least knock on the door, call somebody. But now everything is online. So you might as well get as, as familiar with the computer as you can, as much as you can the, phot the photographs. Because, you, I mean, and I, for me, they, they, they're so challenging that I start shooting with small format cameras, small, inexpensive cameras. And I found that the more time that you have to spend learning how to operate the camera, the less time you have time to focus on the composition, the lighting, there are all these other things you need to focus on. But you got this camera that does 12,000 different things, and you got to sit down and memorize most of these times. Some of these things to be able to say, yeah, well, I got this camera and it does this. Can it walk? No, I can't walk in it. Can it take good pictures? Not you, but it can take good pictures. Then you can you spend your money for some, but you have to be able to take good pictures. So all I have to do is like we did. Keep pushing. I never. I'm 82 years old and never expected that I would be here and at least recognized for what I've done in photography. So. I just kept pushing. I said, this is what I love. And again, I love photography. So that was, you know, I did it. You know, I used to volunteer. You, you need a volunteer. Yeah, I'll volunteer. I'll teach these kids. But and all the time that after teaching kids for 40 years, I got really good at photography, believe it or not. So you got to find a way to keep yourself employed, to pay your rent, and then you can then deal with photography. But if you can't pay your rent, you don't want to stay home forever. So, but I mean, you just gotta, you gotta do it. And don't let people tell you, well, my mother used to say, when are you gonna get a real job? I have, you know, I met somebody recently that said, are you still taking pictures? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know any, I told him I didn't learn how to do anything else. So I was stuck. <laughs> so, so that's the, that's the quote, that's the answer I hope. Okay, Danny. John, thank you. It was good spending the day with you, brother. Again, the, the, the show is Lost and Found at the Booth Silver yeah. Screen Gallery, 529 West 20th Street. Yes. So, so it'll be up until the end of the week. Yeah. And when I got some technical stuff that I got to ask you to, so I'll call you and talk to you about it. Okay, beautiful. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.